All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today, we are continuing Unit 8, our last unit in AP Biology, um, by discussing topic 8.2, which is energy flow through ecosystems. So we're going to be switching gears a little bit here from responsive to the environment to energy flow through ecosystems. Um, but we're going to make one drawback connection here towards the beginning of the video, our last video and the beginning of this video. Um, and we asked the question, what makes a living thing a living thing, right? And these are the seven different components that every living thing needs to be able to do, right? In our last video, we talked about how every living thing needs to be able to respond to stimuli. This time, we're talking about how all living things must metabolize, meaning they need to have some kind of energy intake and some kind of energy output in order for them to accomplish cellular functions and do all these other things. Okay? It needs to be able to have energy and use energy um, in order to have all these other things to be alive. Right? So metabolism, you can't have a living thing without metabolism. Okay? All organisms require energy to maintain organization, grow, and reproduce. Okay, so all those functions before, they're not possible without metabolism. And they, they're not possible without a net gain of energy. And by net, I mean that there needs to be more of an energy intake than there is an output. Okay, so if the energy gained is greater than energy lost, then you get energy storage and you get growth as an organism. But if you lose more energy than what you gain, then you're going to get a loss of mass and eventually death. Okay, so you need to be having this constant input of energy if you're a living thing. Um, some need more energy than others, and that's what we're going to talk about here in just a second. Um, a couple of uh, examples of how organisms use e energy differently from one another and how their energy requirements are different. Um, so if we're talking about animals here in particular, endotherms are a type of animal that use energy from metabolism to maintain their body temperature. So we as mammals and this uh, pygmy horse here, they are endothermic, meaning that we are able to use our metabolism, use our food and our energy that we get from our food in order to maintain our own body temperature. Okay, So that energy that we get from our food, some of it goes towards make sure, making sure we stay at, you know, in the United States, it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we got to stay at that level and we got to make sure our body temperature is normal. Um, by making sure we have enough energy intake to, to allow that to happen. Other animals like ectotherms, which is the opposite of an endotherm, they regulate their temperature behaviorally, and they don't have internal mechanisms for maintaining body temperature. Okay, so if you're a turtle, if you're one of these turtles over here, what you, you, you might be able to eat a little less because you're not required to maintain your own internal body temperature if you're a, a turtle or a reptile or amphibian or a fish. Um, so ectotherms regulate their temperature behaviorally. So you're going to see lots of times these reptiles um, basking out in the sun. They're trying to maintain their body temperature. So they'll go sit out in the sun and let the sun heat them up a little bit. Um, and that's the reason why uh, you never really see reptiles a whole lot in like the Arctic Circle because uh, they're not able to have this internal maintenance of their body temperature. They need to you know, be in an area that they can maintain their regular or regulate their body temperature by just being out in the environment. Um, so endotherms obviously are going, going to need more energy than ectotherms. Um, and different organisms have different reproductive strategies based on how much energy is available to them. Okay, so let's, t let's compare and contrast these two animals here. Which one is going to probably need more energy? Well, it's definitely going to be the blue whale, the largest animal to ever exist. It's going to be, need a lot more energy, okay, in order to maintain itself. The mouse is not going to need that much. It doesn't need that much metabolism because it's very small. These are both mammals. Um, they're both kind of related to each other in that they're both part of the class mammalia. But um, they're definitely going to need different amounts of energy. Just imagine how much this endothermic whale needs to eat in order to maintain itself. It's, it's like, enormous. Um, I'm pretty sure its heart is, like, the size of a car, which is crazy. All right? Um, but reproductive strategies vary as well based on energy availability and size. Okay? So think about this. A mouse is able to reproduce six to eight pups every three weeks. And did you know m mice have pups? I didn't know that pups was the word before I started making this video. And a blue whale only has a calf every two to three years, 
Okay, so think about that. It takes a lot of energy to reproduce. There's more energy available to this mouse. It doesn't require as much, and there's probably more energy available to it than to the blue whale, which only is going to reproduce once every, one calf every two to three years. Okay, think about how many mice could be born in three years like that. Okay, so uh, metabolic rates are different depending on body, body mass and the size of the organisms, right? Um, so a smaller animal tends to have a higher metabolic rate. So this mouse, because it's reproducing more, even though it's a smaller size, right? Even though it's a smaller size, it's probably going to need to eat more for its body size relative to its body size because it reproduces so much and because it has such a high metabolic rate, okay? This, uh, the blue whale is not going to have as high of a metabolic rate, okay? Maybe it's, um, it's adapted to less energy, less food available to it, okay? So and also, you know, that also ties back to its low reproductive rate. Um, a big animal, big animals tend to have higher metabolic, or excuse me, big, big animals have l low reproductive rates and low metabolic rates. That's what I meant to say. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, so it's pretty well established that every living thing needs energy. And, you know, depending on whether you're endotherm or ectotherm or if you're big or small or how much you reproduce, um, depends on your energy requirements, your metabolism requirements. But how do organisms obtain matter and energy? Well, there's several, several different strategies depending on what you are. Okay, so uh, there's autotrophs. This is one strategy of getting energy. Um, organisms that capture energy from physical or chemical sources in the environment. And the most famous photo are, uh, autotrophs are photoautotrophs, which are plants, algae, or other photosynthetic organisms. They're able to obtain energy by absorbing sunlight, allowing that sunlight to go through, um, you know, photosynthesis, using that sunlight for photosynthesis, to make their own glucose and make their own carbohydrates. Uh, we talked about that back in Unit 3, that whole process of how that occurs. Um, photoautotrophs are able to use sunlight to make their own food. Thus, it is an autotroph. Photo meaning light. Okay? But that's not the only kind of autotroph. There's also chemoautotrophs, organisms that capture energy from small inorganic molecules in their environment. All right, so going back to 7.13 as well, it's believed that some of the first organisms on Earth were chemoautotrophs, meaning that they can capture these inorganic molecules and extract energy from them used to survive. Okay, so if you live in a cave like this, you're a microorganism, you live in a cave, you're not getting any sunlight, right? If you live at the bottom of the ocean, you're not getting any sunlight. So how are those ecosystems sustained? Well, they're sustained via chemoautotrophs, right? Uh, so going back to the bottom of the ocean, Hey, there's no sunlight down there, but it's some of the most vibrant ecosystems on Earth at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe that's because the autotrophs are, they're chemoautotrophs. They're, they're, be, they're able to collect energy from inorganic molecules that are spewing up from Earth's crust. Okay? Uh, so those are autotrophs. They're able to make their own food, but the, not all organisms can. Can you make your own food? Can you stand out in the sunlight and, you know, just like, oh, I'm, I'm full. I'm full. I'm good. Like, no, you can't because you're a heterotroph, and heterotrophs capture energy from molecules produced by other organisms. So I put in italics here, heterotrophs, they eat things, okay? You and I and all animals, we are able to obtain energy from carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids that we ingest by eating other things, okay? Our digestive systems are, are what they're built for is they're, um, we take our food, Okay, we break them down into those component carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and we piece them back together in order to make ourselves. Okay, that's really what that's what metabolism is when it comes to uh, when it comes to animals. All right, so heterotrophs are those that have to eat other animals to get their energy. Autotrophs and heterotrophs exchange matter and energy in an ecosystem. All right, now this is coming back to the ecology bit. And uh, ecos an ecosystem is the sum of all the organisms living in a given area and the abiotic factors or non-living factors with which they interact. Okay, so a coral reef is an example of an ecosystem. A rainforest is an example of an ecosystem. Okay, you can even build an ecosystem. Um, I, I've seen like middle schoolers build an ecosystem in a bottle where they have some autotrophs and they have some heterotrophs and they have some abiotic factors. They have like dirt and air and different kinds of light. Those are abiotic factors, but all play a role in the functioning of that ecosystem and those living things, okay? So that's what an ecosystem is. And energy has to flow through an ecosystem. 
energy that comes into an ecosystem has to flow through all the organisms in it in order for that ecosystem to stay alive. And matter, meaning like molecules, um, chemicals, food, all that stuff, it needs to be cycled through an ecosystem. So this is what I'm saying here. Matter must be continuously cycled through an ecosystem and energy must be continuously flowing through an ecosystem from an outside source. Okay, an ecosystem needs both matter and energy in order for it to be functional. Okay, um, energy, it really only goes one way, right? It follows the laws of thermodynamics. It can't be reused. Once it's used, it's that's it, and it uh, adds to the entropy of the universe. And a lot of it is lost to heat. Okay, energy transfers are inefficient according to the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so energy flows through in one direction, but matter is cycled. But we're going to be mostly talking about energy here. Ecosystems follow the law of conservation of mass and the conservation of energy. No matter or energy is m matter or energy is destroyed, and that means that matter and energy are conserved within an ecosystem. It stays the same. Okay, the amount of energy coming into the ecosystem is the same as the amount of energy going out of the ecosystem. It doesn't necessarily stay in there and just absorb more. Okay, there's an inflow and an outflow. Okay, but the, here's the here's the important part. This is when we're coming back to the autotrophs and heterotrophs here. Um, this is how energy flows through an ecosystem. So let's just say we're talking about a terrestrial on land ecosystem. Where is the energy that powers those living things going to come from? It's going to come from the sun. Okay, so the sun is not a living thing. It's an abiotic factor, as you would call it. Okay, so the sun's producing a bunch of energy, and these little guys down here, called the primary producers, they're extracting that energy from the sun. Okay, and as we progress up here, okay, we're seeing primary consumers, secondary consumers, third level consumers, apex predators. Um, as we're moving up this energy pyramid, Take a look, there, th this percentage gets lower and lower and lower, and energy is lost as heat, and energy is some lost, lost to some decomposers as well. Okay, so what exactly are we looking at? These different levels on this pyramid, they're basically just links in a food chain, and these are what we call trophic levels, and this is a typical trophic pyramid depicting energy transfer. Um, so energy, as I was saying, energy from the sun goes from one trophic level to the next. We start down here with the primary producers, which are the autotrophs. They support all the other organisms in the ecosystem. Plants, really what they do is they convert sunlight into their own food, but they also, you know, they also get eaten, which means they provide food from, for all the other um, consumers, the heterotrophs in the ecosystem. Okay, so the primary consumers eat the primary producers, the secondary consumers eat the primary consumers, and the tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers, and so on and so forth. And energy goes from one group of organisms to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Okay, um, each are, and that's how energy is transferred with, um, through an organism, or excuse me, through an ecosystem, just by being, just by eating. Okay, energy transfer. Right, this diagram represents how much energy or mass there is at each trophic level. Look at the primary producers. There's a ton of them. There's a ton of energy available, and there's a ton of biomass at the primary producers level. Okay, then there's slightly less at the primary consumers, less than that at the secondary consumers, and then there's a tiny amount available for the tertiary consumers. Why is that? Well, upon each energy transfer, okay, if the primary producers are getting their stuff from the sun, and primary consumers eat the primary consumers, Consumer, or excuse me, the primary consumers eat the primary producers, only 10% of the energy passes from one trophic level to the next. The rest is lost as heat. Okay? So let's just say, you know, the primary producers in a particular ecosystem, they absorb 50,000 joules of sunlight, uh, joules are a unit of energy, joules of sunlight from the sun, okay? the primary consumers, whatever eats the producers, whatever eats plants, um, only gets 10% of that. So they only get 5,000. Okay, whatever eats the primary consumers, the secondary consumers, are only going to get 500, and the tertiary only get 50 joules of energy. So that's like 0.1% of what, the, what this originally was. Okay? So that's why we're going to see a lot more plants and a lot more autotrophs in an ecosystem than, say, these top-level predators, because there's less energy available to them. Okay, and that's another difference between the mouse and the whale. There's more energy available to a mouse because it's a primary consumer than, say, to a whale, which is probably a tertiary or quaternary consumer. There's going to be more energy available 
to those mice and it's going to reproduce more. Okay, so again, to reiterate here, all we're really looking at is just a fancy version of a food chain, right? The cricket eats the leaves, the mouse eats the cricket, the snake eats the mouse, and the eagle eats the snake, okay? The, uh, what would this be? The phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton. The zooplankton are eaten by the trout, and the trout's eaten by the barracuda, and the barracuda's eaten by the uh, killer whale, okay? Same thing here. The killer whale and the eagle would probably be quaternary consumers, and then the, the leaves and the phytoplankton would be the primary producers, okay? Changes in energy available, availability can cause a ecosystem disruption, okay? If for some reason energy is not available at a particular level, or particularly the producer level, if you get rid of all the producers, the rest of the trophic pyramid and thus the rest of the ecosystem is going to collapse. Less sunlight equals less energy from all trophic levels and fewer producers is less energy for all consumers. Okay, so it's really important to maintain our producers and make sure they have enough biomass and they're getting enough energy um, to support their whole ecosystems. Really, that's what plants do. They support ecosystems and, by extension, life on Earth, really, if we're talking about land. All right, last thing here. A food web, obviously, is more complicated than a food chain because it accounts for a lot more members of a population. Illustrate energy relationships between populations in an ecosystem. Um, so this shows a lot, lot of more different um, energy transfers than just one after the other. And it's more accurate representation of energy flow in an ecosystem. Okay? You can still categorize these by primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, so on. Um, but this is more representative. All right, something I want to leave you with here. Here's a, here's a generalized food web of like a pond ecosystem. Hey, what happens? What happens to all the other organisms and all the other populations in an ecosystem, like, say, if you get rid of the muskrat? Okay, what happens if you get rid of the green sunfish? What could happen? What could change in all these other populations as a result? What would happen if you got rid of all the algae? Okay, or what if you introduce something else completely different and mess this all up? Okay, something to think about, and that's something that we'll get back to later in this unit. But for now, that'll be it for today, and we'll see you next time.